I think it, I, and, and of course, the first thing that occurs to you when you play with LT Spice is, well, you can build NAND gates, which means that in principle LT Spice is compute universal. You could build a computer. Has anybody tried that? Doing it, doing it, doing it. <laughs> Simulating the computer at the transistor level? I'll bet that's slow. It would be interesting to do. Maybe I'll try that one of these days when I have a 500 spare hours. <laughs> Build, building memory. From, uh, it would be massive. But you can build a CPU so there, there are CPUs that exist that have only one instruction, right? And you can build a CPU with only 70 transistors if it only has one instruction. Anybody can think of a, a, a one instruction which is compute universal? How about subtract and branch if negative? It's got to have an arithmetic operation. It's got to have a conditional. Right. All right. Well, let's let's start. We're a minute early, but that's not so bad. So um, I encourage you all again, as part of the reading assignment, to read the policy page, which is linked off of the main page. It is a it is a link right at the top of the page. It explains the grading. It explains when things are due. And I understand that uh, there's been some confusion about that. The first lab is this Friday. It is the week of August 29th, but the lab is on the 2nd of September. The second lab is on the 5th of September. No, 9th. 9th of September. 2nd of September, 9th of September, yes, both on Fridays. And then by the end of the period, by the end of the lab period on the 9th of September, you have to demonstrate a working state machine, cellular automaton state machine, to the TA or to me. Okay, and then one week after that, that would be the 16th of September, you have to turn in a written report describing what you did. Okay, and then on the 16th, we will start the next lab, which you will do for two lab periods, and then turn in a lab report one week after the last lab. So is it clear how this works? So the first lab, you won't have access, routine access to the lab until the first lab this Friday. Um, For two reasons. One, that I prefer to have to introduce people to the lab sort of more uniformly than having you just go in there and start hacking away. And secondly, I don't know where the person is who uh, activates the door. I haven't seen her for three days. So I've got the list, which you filled out last, uh, last week, ready to, to give to her, but I haven't seen her. So. We will see what happens on that. And lastly, uh, one of the links in lab one was wrong. Uh, Darbin found it when he was going through the lab. I corrected it. It was a VGA link which was incorrectly linked. Did anybody find that? It went to the wrong page. Nobody emailed me, which means to me nobody read it. You better read that thing real soon. If you find a bad link or a complete, completely incomprehensible link, email me because I do change the organization of the page. And while Dreamweaver can find 
logical change, syntactical errors, it can't find policy changes. It can't correct for policy changes. Last time I talked, I ended up talking about the um, SRAM chip and uh, then talked a little bit about the, the demo code, the, the, the code I want to talk about today. Are there any questions about policy or due dates or the static RAM stuff we talked about last time? <clears throat> and I think I ended up talking about the random walker, 2D random walker, which is not what you're going to implement. But it's what I'm going to do, use to show off the, uh, uh, to build a uh, SRAM state machine. But I did want to show you the result of what a diffusion limited aggregation looks like. I believe I ended up by defining a diffusion limited aggregation last time. So, if you start with if you start with one cell in the center and then release a cell at any of the corners and let it randomly diffuse by random walk by white noise random walk this is the structure you get and it's fractal because as you release material from the corners it becomes harder and harder but not impossible for a particle to deposit itself on the end of that branch right there. But to do that, it has to take a very specific path in and not hit anything else. Because if it hits anything else, it stops. You see that way over there? Can you see that over there a little bit? Bend your eyes around. Uh, so. For the two-dimensional case that I'm going to talk about, this is what you would expect to see after uh, maybe uh, 10 or 12 million uh, cycles, maybe 100 million cycles. So. <clears throat> The other thing we need to talk about with regard to this is the VGA control. Talked about static RAM. Need to talk about VGA. There is a VGA module that I grabbed from the DE2 distribution. DE2, I think part of the reading for the first week was to read the DE2 user's manual. The DE2 distribution includes uh, an interface to VGA controller, which it turns out that uh, it has a couple of errors in it, which I didn't find, but some students have. And one student last year, Skylar Schneider, who some of you may know, is uh, uh, kind of a mutant programmer, uh, wrote a better one. And it's linked up on Lab 1 if you want to use it instead of the old one. But basic basic VGA interface which we're going to use for this lab generates a 640 by 480 raster so 640 pixels across 480 down it is a 25.175 pixel megahertz pixel clock so each pixel exists on the screen for one twenty-five millionth of a second. The image is composed of scan lines. So there's a logical drawing point that runs across the screen, progressive scan. And every time we reach the end of a frame and start a new frame, there is a required 
synchronization pulse. Every time we start a new line, there's a required synchronization pulse. VGA interface is five lines, red, green, blue, V-sync, and H-sync. On this board, red, green, and blue are all 10-bit numbers. And they must all be 0 during sync. V-sync is a 60 microsecond pulse, 60 microsecond pulse once every, well, what is it? It's about 16.68 milliseconds. H-sync is a 3.77 microsecond pulse every 31.77 microseconds. There's a state machine in the VGA interface you're being supplied which generates the sync signals for you. It also generates the, it outputs to the monitor the red, green, and blue signal plus V-sync and H-sync and it outputs back to you as a logic signal the address of the next pixel it needs. So you know what to give it next, and then it displays it. While, while you're on the active raster, it requires new information every 125 millionth of a second. And so there has to be some hardware module which is feeding this thing continuously so that the display is, is, is constant. If you don't display constantly, if you every once in a while can't keep up with the display and skip a V-sync or an H-sync or you skip some numbers that you're feeding to it, then you get flickering or worse, torn images flashing all over the screen. You'll know when it's wrong. So what comes back out of the, the interface that comes to the, the monitor looks like this. What comes back at you is a, a 10 bits of, of x coordinate and 10 bits of y coordinate. So you could go up to a 1,000 by 1,000 display if you wanted. So from the VGA's point of view, you're certainly going to have to have some SRAM here. VGA module. The VGA module is going to send some data out to the, to the monitor. But it's also going to send back an address then, which is going to be fed by data from SRAM. Right? <clears throat> now the version I'm going to show you uses SRAM, which is shared between the state machine which is generating the 
cellular automaton and the VGA module. So we can't just generate an address like this because part of the time the address is going to be generated by the, by the, by the automaton state machine. <coughs> so we've got to multiplex this a little bit, which makes it somewhat annoying. So this is external SRAM I'm dealing with today. And I'm going to write out the code for it sooner or later, whenever we get to it. I'm not going to write out the code for the version that uses M4K blocks instead of external SRAM, but it is on the VGA page for your perusal. It is the last example on the VGA page. And you might want to look at that as another example of code that doesn't require quite such careful multiplexing because the, the M4K blocks are dual ported. The external SRAM is single ported. <clears throat> so we need an address input for certain, but that's going to be run now by a MUX. And the MUX can either get input from from SRAM or from the cellular automaton state machine and so if we're in sync mode that means we don't need to feed the we don't need to feed RGB data to the, to the monitor. And so if we're in sync mode, we can take addresses from the state machine. If we're not in sync mode, in other words, if we're displaying, if we're not during, during a sync pulse, we're going to have to take data from the from VGA module, yes. Let me not short circuit this quite so much. Data is going to go to VGA, but of course, it's also going to be coming from the state back to the state machine. There's a write enable here, which has to be, does it have to be muxed? I saw one, one tentative head twitch negative, two head tentative head twitches negative. So does that, so is the answer yes or no? You're saying it's no. Why? That's right. So, so this the VGA is always reading data from the SRAM, never writing it, and so it can never has to control the write enable. And of course, there's going to be a reset input here. A reset input. Now, one other thing we need is that unless we have a pair of address registers and we're really careful about handling addresses, every time the VGA needs data, it's going to take over the address bus and it's going to trash some address register someplace, which means that the, 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 the cellular automaton state machine is going to lose where it was in the calculation. So we need some feedback from the VGA monitor to the state machine, which says, uh, 
have I messed you up? And we're going to have a, a lock unlock. At the beginning of a calculation, we're going to set a lock in the, in the, in the cellular automaton. And if, if, if a VGA, if the VGA takes over the address bus before the end of the calculation, then the VGA unlocks the lock and the calculation has to be thrown away and done over. Or recouped somehow. <coughs> yes? To the to the to the CA state machine? From the state machine to the SNAP, we should be having data. Right? right, this is bidirectional. Quite right. So, we need to build a state machine that is going to, at broad outline, we're either going to be in reset mode or we're going to be in VGA display mode or we're going to be in CA state machine calculate mode. So either calculations are beginning, going to be occurring to update SRAM, or we're going to be displaying SRAM, or the whole system is going to be sitting there waiting for the human to do something. Yeah? No, that's a bi this is a, a bi-directional data bus, really, right? except that it's only going this way here but it's going both directions here. So this is so the external SRAM is going to have to be fed into a tri-state on on these interfaces. So the 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 sort of large scale outline is going to be that if we're in reset and remember, in reset, what we're going to do is we're going to draw the VGA and put one pixel in the center of it as a seed. This is not what you're going to do. You're going to do something completely different at reset time. What I'm going to do in this example is I'm going to put one cell in the middle of the screen and then release a cell at one of the corners to diffuse. So we're just going to set some state variable to init. We're going to clear screen. And that's all. Else if. I'm going to do the pseudocode first, and then after the pseudocode, we'll expand it out into some ungodly mess of uh, Verilog. If we're during sync, then we're going to do a case state, and this is going to be four boards long. It's going to be a monstrous big state machine. So I'm not going to write it out right here, but I'm just going to say, leave a big spot for this. <clears throat> the first one is going to be init. And here we're going to draw, draw a dot. Draw a dot and set the state. goes to test one. We'll continue on that in a minute, so we're going to be able to expand this out into a much bigger
structure, but the last part of this else, so we don't get lost with this structure, is the VGA display. And here we're going to have a lock reset. And then we'll set up a structure so that uh, VGA controls RAM. Now we have to fill in the rest of this state machine. <clears throat> So the, the next state, as you might guess, we're going to write out is test one. And you'll remember that we have to set up a read or a write to the, state, to the SRAM one cycle before we use the data. So we're going to set up a read by loading an address, pulling write enable high, which disables it. We're going to grab an address. Put an address on the address bus, 15 nanoseconds later, in other words, one cycle later, the data is valid and we can read it. So we have to initiate the first read. And what we're going to do here is we're going to, actually what we're going to do, let me explain a little bit more. What we're going to do is we're going to check the nearest neighbors of this pixel to see if We have our target pixel here. Let's say that we have the test pixel we're moving around is here. We're going to test the nearest neighbors of this test pixel to see if any of them are occupied. So if the test pixel is here, the nearest neighbors are not occupied because we're only going to do the uh, four nearest neighbors. And if it is here, they are one of them is occupied, and therefore we now stabilize this. We mark, draw it on the screen, and then reduce it, re release another walker to walk around the screen. So we have to test the four nearest neighbors to see if any of them is at value one. And so what we're going to do is just a sum of the four nearest neighbors, and if the sum is greater than zero, then we draw the pixel and release a new walker to diffuse from one of the corners. So in test one, we're going to set a lock. Aha! So here's where we're setting the lock. In the very last step at the end here, we're going to ask, is the lock still set? If it is, the calculation is good. If the VGA has interrupted everything, the, the lock will be reset and it won't be good. So we're going to set a lock here. We're going to read. We're going to set up the address for the left neighbor. Set up an address for the last neighbor, for the left neighbor. And then we're going to go to the next state. For test two state, we're going to add sum equals sum. Well, I guess we don't have to say add and and that. We'll just say sum equals sum plus left neighbor value. Because now it is one cycle later, we're going to get to test two one cycle after test one. And so the address that we set up here is now has valid data here, and we can add it. Then we need to set up a read for the right neighbor and go to state test three. 
in test three, we do sum equals sum plus right. Set up the read for the upper neighbor and go to state equals test four. And in test four, sum equals sum plus upper, read lower neighbor and go to test five. Now we've at this point we have read all of the we've read we've gotten the sum done except for sum equals sum plus lower, that ends the sum. And then we just go to test six. I'm not, by the way, claiming that this is a minimal state machine. It turns out that there are several states in the state machine that you can collapse and make the state machine run faster. And that's one of the optimizations you may wish to do in your state machine for the one-dimensional automaton. Test six. Now we've got the sum. If, if the lock is still set and the sum is greater than zero, then we're going to go to We're going to draw the walker, and otherwise, otherwise, we're going to update it. Now, in this case, update means to move it randomly around the screen by one pixel. Any questions? Questions? So the algorithm is that if we're sitting here and we're not and we don't get bound, so we're going to move on the next step, that we're going to roll, we're going to generate two random bits. One random bit is going to control whether we go left, right. So we're either going to go left or right. And the other random bit determines whether we go up or down. So we're always going to take a step, either left or right, or up and down, or both. Both. But in, in a random direction, random combination. It turns out that that's adequate to model diffusion. So, we have state draw, in which we're going to write SRAM. In other words, we have, to, we have to put a marker in SRAM telling the VGA to display that pixel the next time around. And then state goes to new walker because we have to start a, a new walker. Otherwise, we go to update. And here, we add random numbers 
to x and y, while of course checking screen boundaries to make sure we're not falling off the edge of the compute area. Because if you're, you can't go below zero or above 640 or below zero or above 640, uh, 480 in the other direction. So we have to check screen boundaries. <clears throat> then we have to generate new random numbers. And then state goes back to test one. So we've closed the loop there. We have one more state we have to generate, which is new walker. Here we're going to choose a random corner. A corner. And since that's going to be random, we need to generate new random numbers. And then go to state goes to test one. And at that point we've we've closed every possible path through the state machine back to test one. <clears throat> so it's an endless loop. make a mistake. Yes, in this case it doesn't matter because for this particular state machine if it, if it happens to get interrupted during a calculation it's as if you have imperfect stickiness and the, and the, and the, and the walker bounces off when it shouldn't but it hardly matters. For your cellular automaton it absolutely does matter because you're going to be doing a deterministic automaton and if you blow the calculation you have to do it again you can't just ignore it and so you not only this doesn't even this detects the lock but it doesn't repair the the error your version is going to have to repair the error you're going to have to redo the calculation or you're going to have to use dual ported memory where the collision never happens. Your choice. I know what I'd do. <clears throat> where, for instance? Oh, these should all be these, uh, I think we're going to find, are all clocked and should all be blocking. Yeah. Pardon me? I'm sorry, not, they should all be non-blocking. Yeah, right, sorry. Yeah. So, now, again, all of the examples I'm going to talk about are online so I have I always have mixed feelings about going through a, a, a big gob of code in lecture but um, I will once we'll go through the, the whole the whole disaster for this for this uh, first one and then after that I'll start abstracting pieces and not do the all of the all of the uh, all of the interfaces every time this particular example is in the VGA page example 3 VGA page 
example three. The the version that uses dual ported uh, M4K blocks is example four. <clears throat> And I want to be explicit about that, example three and example four, because I've noticed a reading pattern lately in students, and that is students read a web page until they get to the first executable code, and then they don't read anymore. All right? In this case, that will give you the least optimized code. You want to go for the one it's most optimized, so read to the bottom of the page. <coughs> Example four. Many, many pages I've, I say, okay, okay. I, I, I write things like a story, but I'll turn it around and write it like a blog. I'll write it upside down. Here's what I did last. Here's today's code first. Now we'll go through the history. And on some pages, particularly for 4760, I do that because I don't want to have to stand up there and say, read the whole damn page every time. Right. I just really, I, okay, I'll, I, 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 I bow to the, to the new way of reading. Everybody reads stuff backwards now, so okay, I'll write it backwards. Actually, I write it forwards and then I invert it. <clears throat> so, but but uh, this particular page has not been inverted yet, so you have to read through to example four. There are certain things that get to you when you teach a lab, like uh, for, for many years we used an, a part called an LM34 temperature sensor in the 4760 lab. And I just said, you know, I stated use an LM34 and people would get one out of the door and say, how do I hook it up? Say, do you have access to the web? Oh yeah! And that's the right thing to do, except that after you've heard that question 8,000 times, you say, okay, I'll put a diagram on the board, just don't ask me again. It's the wrong thing to do pedagogically, but you get tired, and so you make it easier. <clears throat> In this class, I just assume you can look it up. Lab one will, does point to a very useful piece of code. TOP dot V. It is a cleaned up version of the top level interface for the FPGA. The FPGA has 430 I.O. lines, all of which are mapped to specific pieces of external hardware. You do not want to memorize or even know how those are hooked up. And the, there are two pieces of data that you need so that you don't have to think about that. One is DE2 top, which enumerates all of the logical signals that are used by the top I.O. interface of the FPGA. And then there is a separate file which is outlined in um, in lab one whose name I can't remember right now. It's a CVS file that does the mapping from, pardon me? It's called assignment, some pin assignment .cvs, is that what it's called? Thank you. Maybe it's pin assign 
CVS. And that file has the relation between the physical pins on the FPGA and the logical signals which are outlined in DE2 top. You need both of those. The symptoms will be See, a Quartus II doesn't care if you actually have physical pins hooked up or not because it just makes a self-consistent load for the FPGA. So let's say that you use DE2 top, you have all perfect code, you forget to assign pins, you compile it, you put it on the FPGA, and the system is deaf, dumb, and blind. And the symptoms will be that the LED displays, the liquid crystal displays, and the LED displays that are on the board will display random, not even random characters, but random pieces of characters because the optimizer just sets some of the bits high and some are low, whatever was handy. And so you got nothing. So whenever you see the LED displays on the board showing random junk, not zeros, not blanks, but just junk, bits of fragments of characters, you should say to yourself, I wonder if I assigned the pins, rather than asking the TA, who will then say, you forgot to assign the pins. <clears throat> but it looks better if you can figure it out yourself. So the DE2 top module has an interface section has an interface section that looks something like this. I'm not going to write it all out because it is hundreds of lines long because there are <coughs> signals for clock 27, clock 50, external clock, key, switch, LED green, LED green, LED red, one, two, three, four, five, six, six signals for SRAM, three signals for the LCD, check, six signals for the LCD, eight signals for the VGA, Six signals for flash, ten signals for SD RAM, uh, another seven or eight for the hexadecimal displays, and so it goes. It's just hundreds of lines of stuff because it's everything that's on the on the board. But we're not going to use it all for this particular exercise, mercifully. <clears throat> but we are going to need an input. clock underscore 27 and clock underscore 50. Clock underscore 50, as you might guess, is a 50 megahertz external crystal. Clock 27 is a 27 megahertz external crystal. For, for again, for reasons that escape me, this one is connected directly to a clock network. This one has to be enabled before you can use it. And the symptom will be if you forget to enable the 27 megahertz clock, and I'll show you how to do that probably next time. If you forget to enable the 27 megahertz clock, everything seems to be working fine except the VGA is blank. Input three down to zero of key. Key is the is what the uh, Altera calls the four push buttons that are on the board. These are debounced push buttons that are logic low when pushed, so they're active low. Input. 17 down to 0 
of switch. These are toggle switches. In other words, they maintain their state when you take your finger off of them. They are toggle switches which on the board looking at the board from the edge with the toggle switches on it they are they produce a one when they're away from the edge of the board and a zero when they're toward the edge of the board <clears throat> there are 18 bits wow that's kind of handy because the SRAM address is 18 bits oh so you could exercise you could use this as a way of exercising SRAM but you're going to only use 8 bits of this for this lab, 8 bits of these switches, which are going to set the cellular automaton rule. So the rule you pick, 0 through 255, is going to be set by the lower order set 8 switches here. Then there is a bus which is called an in-out <coughs> bless you, 15 down to 0 of SRAM underscore DQ sadly that stands for input and output and not Dairy Queen <coughs> uh, this is a bi-directional bus and using the keyword in out makes it a uh, a tri-state buffer. Then there's an output 17 down to 0 of SRAM address which is the SRAM address and then a whole bunch of one bit outputs SRAM underscore upper byte underscore N for active low and all of the other control lines we talked about last time then there are some other outputs nine down to zero, ten bit output of VGA underscore red, VGA underscore green, VGA underscore blue and the encoding is what you might expect that a binary zero, binary zero is black and a binary all ones, ten ones, let's see that would be uh, 3FF, right? A binary 3FF is full intensity. So 3FF, 3FF, 3FF is white. 3FF, 3FF, 0 would be yellow and so on. VGA horizontal sync, VGA vertical sync, VGA blank, VGA clock underscore clock all of these interfaces are run for you by the VGA module you don't connect to these with your code you connect to the VGA IO module the VGA control module with your code which then connects with these IO lines directly the SRAM interface is simple enough that you run it yourself. You can just toggle lines in a very simple state machine. 
Everything else you're going to run yourself through the I/O interface. Any questions about this? I strongly suggest rather than rather than copying this on the fly, go look at it online and maybe even print it, but at least get it online so you can look at it while we're talking. Any questions? So on Friday, we're going to come in and get started in the lab, which means we will set up the board, show you where the software is, how to implement stuff, and then uh, over the next week you'll have access to the lab, and by a week from Friday, by the 9th, you should have it all running. Thank you.